Welcome to the 16th Annual Wallet and Steel Awards for the best in investigative business journalism. My name is Jeff Timmermans. Uh, I am the director of the Reynolds Center and the Donald W. Reynolds Chair in Business Journalism here at Cronkite. The Reynolds Center established the Barlett and Steele Awards in 2007 to recognize the importance of investigative business journalism and to promote in-depth, accurate journalism in the public interest, which is the mission of the center. This year is the first year we have three different categories. We've expanded the awards to better recognize the outstanding work being done at so many regional and local publications in investigative business journalism throughout this country. We've also started our first ever award for outstanding young journalists. This is an attempt to honor the incredible talent being developed throughout this country and to encourage and foster this talent for the future. These awards are named for the only reporting team to ever receive two Pulitzer Prizes for newspaper reporting and two National Magazine Awards for magazine work, Don Barlett and Jim Steele. And we're delighted to have Jim Steele, the Steele of Barlett and Steele, here with us tonight. The first time Jim's made the trip in three years. Um, Jim, would you like to say a few words? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, it's always a, a delight to be out here, uh, visit with students. Uh, there's always been a great spirit of this journalism school, and the fact the awards are here is just a, a very appropriate place for this because everybody is so dedicated to that kind of excellence uh, and always has been. There's another reason uh, that I'm very happy tonight, and that is that I didn't have to judge this contest. <laughs> I mean, you're going to hear about some really good journalism tonight. And the ones that maybe you don't hear about in depth, you can see online uh, where they are. Uh, and, and this work is absolutely spectacular. And it brings into play all the great things that are propelling business journalism uh, to the sophistication that we see today. You're talking about data, you're talking about documents, and you're also talking about some very, very poignant and moving personal stories. You know, that's the other thing. In the whole movement toward data and documents, which is extremely important, of which I've been involved in my whole, almost my entire journalism career, uh, these do not supplant interviews. You know, human beings are as important as ever. And that's one of the great things about all of these pieces. There's this, they're universally excellent, and they're also universally, you feel them throbbing with life in these portraits of the people involved in these stories. So, and I, I think back to what business journalism used to be uh, in my uh, youth. I mean, basically, the, the, the companies gave you a release, uh, earnings are up 3%, uh, we're laying off 100 people, we're hiring 100 people, we're going to build a building at Oak and Walnut. You know, really exciting stuff, huh? <laughs> uh, I mean, it shows you how far uh, business journalism has come uh, when you read these particular articles, the sophistication in them of using all of these uh, things that we have at our command now. So I think without saying anything further, we're going to get on with our, with our, with our program here. And afterward, we want to hear from as many of you uh, who have questions, because that's one of the reasons we're here. We're here not, not just for this award, but we're here to visit with you, talk about journalism, any questions you have, anything about these particular articles is fine, but everything is, the door is open to anything you want to talk about. I just want to say again how um, honored and delighted I am to be here, and I look forward to the discussions we're going to have. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. As Jim mentioned, we will have an opportunity for Q&A with uh, all the award winners who are here tonight. We're pleased that so many of them have been able to join us here in the room. Um, I do want to take a, mo a moment to acknowledge all the award winners this year, uh, even those who are not with us tonight, uh, because th the work, as, as Jim mentioned, really is, is instrumental in exposing injustice and inspiring calls for change. And uh, this is what we celebrate tonight and what we want to honor. As I mentioned, we have a, a new category here. We have a global and national category. Uh, and we have a regional and local category. So each category has a, a gold, silver, and bronze award. And starting with the uh, global national category, the bronze award this year goes to questionable practices, an investigation into the largest medical health, uh, mental health startup in the United States, Cerebral, written by a team of reporters from Bloomberg. 
Their work dove into how Cerebral continued to use strong and deceptive marketing tactics to bring in patients, despite the number of clients who have been negatively impacted by their practices. <clears throat> the Silver Award in the global national category goes to Hidden Interests by reporters at the Wall Street Journal. Their investigation examined more than 130 judges who broke the law when they did not recuse themselves from cases involving parties that they had financial or familial ties. We are pleased to have the winners of the Silver Award uh, here with us tonight. Well, one of them, at least, uh, James Grimaldi of the Wall Street Journal, who will come up and accept the award. James. One more, one more, one more. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, for the Gold Award, in their seven-part podcast series, Sent Away, reporters from American Public Media, the Salt Lake Tribune, and KUER Public Radio teamed up to expose the limitations of government oversight within the troubled teen treatment industry which earned them the gold award this year in the global national category. We have David Fox, Curtis Gilbert, Jessica Miller, and Will Kraft here to accept their award. Guys, come on up on stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So moving now to the regional and local category, uh, the Bronze Award. The Palm Beach Post and ProPublica's joint investigation won the Bronze Award this year for their in-depth investigation uh, driven by human stories backed with actual data that shows how the sugar industry and state organizations have not properly addressed the pollution residents in lower income areas of Florida are experiencing. The series is called Black Snow. The Silver Award in the regional local category goes to a duo from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Alan Judd and Wilbury Mariano, for their year-long investigation, Dangerous Dwellings, that examined the squalid living conditions in some of the city's worst apartments. In response to their investigation, Georgia district attorneys announced they were cracking down on negligent apartment complex landlords. The Gold Award in the regional category goes to the Minnesota Star Tribune. Uh, reporters Jeffrey Mitrot and Nicole Norfleet for their series, Unsettled, cashing in on accident victims. Their investigation found that companies pay to take people's future settlement checks worth hundreds of thousands of dollars for immediate and much smaller payments. We're delighted to have Jeffrey Mitrot here to accept the award, the gold award in the regional, uh, sorry, the regional local category. Jeffrey. <laughs> As I mentioned, we're adding uh, another new award today to recognize uh, the tremendous new talent emerging in our industry. Uh, this is part of our effort to, to, to nurture outstanding new talent, uh, which of course is the, the, the very, uh, very central to the mission of the Reynolds Center and Cronkite. Through investigative analysis, Neil Betty of ProPublica identified the countless missteps taken by the FDA that showed the government long knew of problems that patients were never informed of. Informed of. This investigation revealed how easily companies slip through major systemic gaps in government systems that are intended to protect the most vulnerable. And we're delighted to have Neil Betty here with us today. Neil, come up on stage. Thank you.
going to say, you know, why don't you stay up on the stage? Yep. Thank you very much. So as, as, as Jim mentioned, uh, we're delighted to have uh, a panel discussion here with the, the gold winners uh, and Neil, the winner of our inaugural Young Journalist, Outstanding Young Journalist Award. Um, so guys, would you please come up on the stage? Yeah, thank you. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Uh, and then uh, Jim will ask uh, the first few questions and we'll open up to the floor afterwards. Jim. Oh, yeah. Is this thing uh, working? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Curtis, let me start with you. Oh, sure. Um, tell us. Can you hear that? Okay, yeah. I, I, <laughs> even I can hear that one. Uh, just tell us a little bit about how this began. I think the reason I ask this is it's kind of the central question I think we all have about any story. Uh, we all get our ideas from different places. And I could. In my own career, I could list you know, 40 different ways ideas came to me, maybe reading a little item in the paper, seeing something on TV, something somebody said to me. But tell us a little bit about how this whole thing developed, where the idea came from, and how you began to proceed with it. Sure. Well, I think that I started um, looking at this industry maybe like seven years ago when I first started doing investigations as a full-time, like that was my whole job. Um, and so I'd been interested in it since then, and I'd had this idea that there was something going on in Utah, you know, because we would research. There was this place, I'm based in Minnesota, and so there was this big uh, treatment center for troubled teens there that we reported on, shut down as a result. And anyway, I, I, I kind of had a sense as we were looking at com comparable facilities around the country that there was this big thing going on in Utah, but didn't really understand it. Fast forward um, several years, and uh, through a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, we got connected up with KUER, Public Radio, in Salt Lake City. And they had been getting really interested in this industry because it is huge. And uh, through the process of this reporting, we came to understand how big and how kind of anomalous it was in its size. Um, anyway, so uh, the KUER wanted to do a podcast about this. They thought that would be a good way of kind of digging into the industry. Um, we'd done investigative podcasts before at American Public Media, and then, but we felt like we needed documents. We needed this some sort of records to base this investigation on. And um, David Fox says, well, you know, Jessica Miller from the Salt Lake Tribune, you know, she had done this gigantic records request, and I think it's about to get delivered to her soon. It's like, well, let's get her involved in this then, <laughs> you know, and. Um, it kind of worked out great, and I think it truly became bigger than the sum of its parts. Um, each of these organizations and the different reporters brought something different to the investigation, and so that was sort of the genesis of it. That's, that's very good. Um, um, Jeff, tell us about your situation, how, how the whole thing, yeah, am, am the I genesis honest? of it. So uh, our project started in a very organic way, um, working a beat, um, one of the sort of routine things that I did in Minneapolis was comb through the civil docket for story ideas, generally looking just for interesting lawsuits, um, which I've always been fond of writing about. And I kept seeing this company's name showing up in the records, J.G. Wentworth. And I had no idea at that time who J.G. Wentworth was, but sometimes I'd see 15 or 20 cases in a month um, in Minneapolis, which was a lot for, for one party. And uh, out of curiosity, one day I decided to start pulling some of those cases, and I saw what they were. They were um, cases in which where people were seeking court permission to sell these settlement payments, and the prices the companies were paying were jaw-dropping to me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is just messed up, and we should pull on the string and see where it goes. And Neil, how about yourself? Explain us how you got onto this uh, amazing thing on defective heart pumps. Am I correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this, I first found this story actually way back in 2019. Um, I was a reporter at the Tampa Bay Times in Florida, and I was looking for my next investigation. And I was reading the newspaper, looking for some sort of hint. and. I saw an ad at the top of the paper for the Florida Medical Device Symposium, and I guess I have the cynical investigative journalist mind, because the first question I asked myself was, 
which Florida medical device is hurting the most people. Um, <laughs> and so I, I downloaded this big data set from the FDA. They keep a bunch of information on deaths, injuries, other problems. Uh, I sliced it a few different ways, and this one company came up right at the top. Uh, it was called Heartware, and they had more deaths, more injuries than any other company in Florida. Uh, so I immediately started putting in FOIAs, getting curious about it, uh, but this was late 2019. Uh, the pandemic then came and the story got put off. Uh, I ended up being on a completely different investigation in 2020, um, but in 2021, I joined ProPublica and my mandate was to cover the federal government and I realized this story was perfect because what I had found out early on was that the FDA had known this company wasn't meeting federal safety standards all the way back in 2015. Um, and this is a uh, pretty invasive medical device. You have to kind of core out a hole from the patient's heart in order to implant the device into the heart so that it could do some of the work the heart does. Um, and the fact that for seven years the FDA didn't take any punitive action as this company implanted thousands of more of these devices uh, suddenly became a regulatory issue. So started digging deeper. Um, James. Uh, James Gamaldi of the Wall Street Journal is here, uh, one of the other award winners. We ran out of space up here, folks. But James, tell us a little bit about how their, their particular um, uh, study was astonishing in terms of just the sheer collection of data. This was on the conflicts of interest with uh, federal uh, judges. And just tell us a little bit about what triggered your interest in it. There's a mic right there beside you. Uh, because it's, uh, it's a story you've continued to follow, not just with judges, but with federal bureaucrats, executives in the, in the yeah, federal government. Yeah, well, so uh, I was doing a background story on Amy Coney Barrett and was looking for the data in a place that you could download it, uh, and it didn't exist. And calling around, I found out that someone was actually collecting data on judges uh, and all of their financial disclosure forms in one place it was a nonprofit organization. I realized that these records were so difficult to get that this was going to be potentially groundbreaking. And it would, you know, we should have an obligation to sort of look through it and see if we can find any conflicts of interest. And we we're able to see all of the holdings that they had. And we thought, well, let's just run this up against their, you know, the cases they're hearing. If you are own Acme stock, are you hearing a case involving Acme? And Honestly, we didn't think we were going to find a whole lot, and it turned out we found a lot. We found a lot of judges, surprisingly, who were actually owning an interest in a company that was before them. And after we had done those stories, we did, I, I think someone counted it up today, about like uh, 10,000 words. We found 130 judges who had heard case, more than 1,000 cases. Um, Congress got involved immediately and passed a law that now requires these records to be put online. As of today was the deadline that Congress set. You can go online and actually look up the, the financial disclosures of federal judges. They're not all up there yet, but they're, <laughs> the, the administrative office of the courts is trying to do that. And after those stories, our managing editor decided that, uh, hey, why not now, we've, we've done it with members of Congress, which led to the Stock Act. We've done it with judges, which led to the Courthouse Ethics and Transparency Act, which was signed by Biden in May. Why don't we go look at all the other forms that are being filed? And we pulled the forms for 13,000 federal employees, senior service uh, appointed, political appointees, and created another massive database Again, just for the sheer purpose of looking for conflicts of interest, which is, you know, one of the most basic things we do. I mean, if you own stock in a company, you probably shouldn't be in an agency that regulates that company. And we found that was happening over and over again. One in five cases uh, in our data set, we found like, uh, I believe it was one in four in the EPA owned stocks 
and you know polluting industries and and, industry and companies that they regulate. Uh, we found people in the Defense Department who were investing in companies that they were then doing contracts with, uh, and, and we're still working on the stories. We're, we actually plan to probably publish another one before the end of the year. Thank you, James. By the way, if you're out there listening to all this, there's kind of one word that goes through all of these things. James mentioned it, uh, others have as well, and that is the word curiosity. You're curious about how this worked or that worked. Is there anything there? You try things. Curiosity, in many ways, is the heart of journalism, the heart of all, I think, really great discoveries. So always listen to those instincts, if you have them, and uh, see if you can follow them out. So I guess, uh, Jeff, should we turn this open to, uh, I can't remember where. Absolutely, yeah. So where, we'd, we'd like to open it up for, for uh, questions. Any questions? So uh, any questions? Uh, There's a microphone right in the center aisle. If you can please just queue up or line up uh, there. Now, we're not going to dispense any medical device tonight about <laughs> heart pumps or you know, anxiety pills or anything like that. But. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Shahid Megan. I'm in the MAIJ program here at ASU. Um, I think one of the things that, or the themes that I'm noticing with all the stories that you've talked about so far is um, this theme of impact, right? So I think my question is, um, with investigative business journalism, do you all think that the potential for impact is greater when it comes to business as a, uh, in comparison to like other investigative like stories? Hmm. What do you think? Is it more, is the business more ripe for impact? I think it's harder in some ways. I don't know, you know? Oh. Could you repeat the question one second? I'm sorry. I, yeah, I no, it's okay. So I was asking with investigative business journalism, um, is the potential for impact greater, greater when th the stories drop essentially in comparison to other investigative stories? I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think. Every beat that we cover is, is equally, uh, creates equal opportunity for having significant impact. Uh, I think what makes business journalism stand out is that there hasn't been enough of it in my career. I, and, and I'm very encouraged to see how much more good investigative business journalism is being done. But I think we're still not punching up to our weight. I, I still think more newspapers, more media organizations need to be doing this kind of work because I think it is so important. And I, I wish that, you know, we could spread. I, I love the fact that we're up here spreading the gospel because I think this is very fertile territory and can be incredibly impactful. I, I mean, I, I agree with that in terms of impact. I think, I think Jeff's right on that. I think what happens, though, with, with uh, business journalism pieces is that sometimes there's a lot more heat generated I mean, it's one thing to criticize a county official. It's another thing to criticize somebody who heads a company. You know, there's more power on that, on that second thing than there is that, that elected official in many cases. And frankly, that's probably why many newspapers and media outlets over the years have been reluctant to uh, criticize in those areas. So there's, there's sometimes more blowback, there's more heat generated um, in that sense. But beyond that, the process is the same. It makes the stakes higher for what you're doing, uh, and it leaves a much narrower margin for making a mistake. Right. Because you're writing about often companies that have very deep pockets, and if you uh, screw up, they could own your newspaper. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that, count, that county official can't. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, we did not coordinate this, but this is a kind of a follow-up on that. Um, my name's Ryan, I'm a PhD student here, I also teach. Um, and one thing I love about this kind of generation and a lot of students here at the Cronkite School is a lot of students really want to do work that has that impact as well, um, whether it's investigative work or business work. Um, and Jim, you kind of alluded to it at the beginning, right? Um, sometimes business journalism can be about stocks. It can be about stuff that big mergers, acquisitions, stuff like that, that seems so far away from everyday people. So when I'm in my class, you know, what's some tips that you would have that I could pass on to my students about doing work? How do you approach work like this that really does carry that impact? What do you, what do you need? How do you approach you, you just every day when you're in the newsroom? Um, what do you need to kind of like create this work that has this impact that really uh, matters to people who are just on the street, who aren't Wall Street 
on Wall Street or anything like that, but just everyday people. Thanks. I think it's about find, finding something out that people don't really know. You know, my editor for the last seven years was, um, you know, he always said, like, don't, don't tell me what you know. Tell me what you want to know. What, what, what don't we know already? And, it, and start with a question. So that's one thing. Two is, is, is tr really try to answer it and, and try to find facts and data and documents that actually address that. Because I think even in this time when people kind of don't trust the media, or not everyone trusts the media, and um, you know, there's a lot of noise out there, um, I do think that really powerful facts can cut through and can cut across even some of the divides, you know? Because um, people care about abuse of power, you know, across the political spectrum. People care about that. They don't want to see that. And so I think um, if we're really illuminating something that is important and answering a question that hasn't been answered before, that's where the impact comes from. I think one of the fallacies of business journalism is that we're writing about institutions and, and the, not, we're not writing about people. And, and that's so wrong because whether you're writing about uh, the company, well, people are working for that company or people are buying the products. Um, people are being impacted by the company's policies. That they, there may be environmental you know, issues. There's always going to be an impacted population. And to me, the, the, the thing is, you got to find that impact to population so you can connect the dots for people, so they can understand why that story matters. And they can hear the, the voices of the people who are being directly impacted, and, uh, it, because then people actually care about what you're writing about. Are you saying corporations are people? <laughs> I'm saying corporations are run by people. Right. Hi, so I'm Melina Bizier, and my question is kind of basic, but um, it's the field I'm hoping to go into. So, how do you start with like a big project or even a small one? Like, what do you kind of do to get that together before you dive into it? Sure. <laughs> um, so, I think every reporter has a slightly different process, but I think the start is always about building your body of evidence. Because um, you need to know that you have a story before you go too much further. You don't want to be five months into a story, your editor is asking for it, uh, and at the end of the day you find out you don't have anything. So um, I typically start really early on trying to figure out um, who is this story impacting? What evidence of impact do I have? Do I have data on people dying from medical devices? or? Is this data not there? Is the number really small? Um, I think really early on, I'm poking holes into my theories, into what I think the story is, uh, so that I have a grounding of evidence and facts that I can then build on. Um, so that that's usually my mindset in the beginning, and it's honestly my mindset throughout the investigative reporting process. You want to poke the holes uh, that someone else might poke later. Because um, if you poke them, you can fill them in. You can figure out what's the answer. Um, but uh, it's a combination of that, and it's also a combination of, I personally believe it's important to have a relationship with your editor and be checking in with them every couple of weeks or so, letting them know what you got, letting them know what your concerns are, um, so that you're never going off into the distance uh, possibly failing. Uh, you want to give yourself those safety rails. Thank you. That's, that's very good. I would add one thing to this very excellent advice you just heard. Uh, I try to begin everything I do reading before I ever call anybody. And when you're heavily involved in daily journalism, you very often don't have that option. You've got to find out the information right away, so it doesn't work there. But if you have any time at all, read something anything about your subject so that you know the questions to ask when you do speak to somebody and you know whether or not they know what they're talking about. Half the time people aren't lying to us, they just don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> and if you read a little in advance, uh, you've got sort of a leg up on that process. I, I want to throw one thing in there while we're sort of talking about 
project formulation and, and how you get these things past your editors. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with editors who voice their frustrations because reporters come to them with a topic and not a project. Um, because they don't have a question. They have not identified a question that they're trying to answer. Every great investigation is trying to answer at least one fundamental basic question. And it's often, it can be expressed fairly simply. You know, how did that happen? And if you can't go to an editor and say, this is the question that we're gonna to try to answer, and that question's gonna grab them like that, and they're gonna go, damn, I'd like to know the answer to that, um, then you're not ready to pitch. Um, this is all really great advice, so thank you all so much uh, for taking the time to share this with us. Uh, my name is Caitlin Thompson. I'm one of the Masters of Investigative Journalism students. Uh, and all of you are working with private companies in some way, and you've touched on, um, or are investigating private companies, and you've touched on a couple of ways where you are able to find information about those companies, so lawsuits, uh, recall documents in Neil's case. But I'm curious if you have any tips on how to look at those private companies that can seem like a black box, especially in the absence of something like a lawsuit. Well, it's particular to any what the industry is, but I mean, I feel like most businesses probably have at least a few touch points with the government, you know, and, and like, so for instance, we were looking at these teen treatment and uh, companies, yes, they're entirely, well, actually, there is a publicly held company involved in this, but for the most part, they're, they're private companies, um, but they are regulated uh. by, by the state, so they have to be licensed, so there's licensing records you can go after. There were, um, uh, the police are called to these facilities, so there are 911 records and, uh, and, and uh, sometimes criminal charges. Um, there, uh, let's see, what else? Um, uh, there, there's uh, there are contracts. I mean, uh, between public entities and that place children in the facilities, right? And so, um, what inspection first, records, which were a huge part of your thing. What, what's that? Inspection records. Inspection records. Yeah, yeah. That's why right. licensing. That's part of the licensing process. Um, and so, uh, and so, what seems at first like a black box is there's actually a lot of places you can start looking into it. And then you kind of start putting those puzzle pieces together and then you start finding people, right? And then the people can tell you things that the records, ne you know, never can. Um, so the records lead you to people. Sometimes the people then lead you back to more records and you just kind of keep going like this and uh, until you start to kind of see the story gel in front of you. That's really helpful. Thank you. I'm back. Um, <laughs> so we kind of know the skills that make an investigative journalist, right? Like curiosity, um, document state of mind, skepticism, and things like that. But for investigative business journalism, what do you think are some skills that are particularly useful with this niche? And like, how can we start, I guess, developing them if we're interested in getting to this topic in particular? Skills, I think, what are the skills that are necessary? Yeah, what are the skills that are necessary yeah, for this in particular? Uh, probably patience would be high up on that list and following curiosity. Uh, because anytime you're doing anything of any length, um, and most of these projects have been projects of some length, um, there are a lot of black holes. Uh, and, I, and where you just nothing, you don't find anything at all there. They're just empty. I was describing this today to some uh, students I was talking with, and I said, think of a, a blank wall that has 15 doors on it. You open each one of those doors, and you see what's behind it. Behind a lot of those doors is nothing at all. That's part of the process. You know, I mean, Einstein had the greatest quote on this of all, um, on his theory of relativity. It's like somebody said, do you feel like, I can't quote it exactly, but it's to the effect that you've tried 3,000 experiments and you, you haven't proved it, do you feel you've failed? And he said, no, I've just eliminated possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, patience is important. Uh, curiosity is very important. Um, I think those are probably the most important things. One thing that Don and I began doing uh, well after we began working together 
when we were on a big project, we also began writing as we went along, even though we knew a lot of that material would have to be rewritten. But just get it out, uh, rough it out. It's going to have. It, I can't begin to tell you what it does for your mental health when you're working on something a long period of time and you're not doing any writing. So those are little things you can do that uh, add to the process. Uh, but at the top of it, curiosity. Uh, also, in, like we were talking early, some experience in data journalism is very important. You don't have to be an accountant, but you certainly know how to use Excel and to be able to crunch those numbers yourself. You can't depend on everybody to do that. So there are a range of those kinds of tools that are all very, very helpful and at this point um, pretty indispensable to the process. I just want to add, um, I think part of what makes business journalism so difficult is that corporations and industries are so full of jargon and difficult language and processes that almost are purposefully making it difficult for the average person to understand what's going on. And I think you can't forget that you're writing for the average reader. You're writing for someone who is going to pick up the newspaper and you want them to understand what you're talking about. Especially if you're doing investigative journalism, your readers should be outraged because what you're writing about is wrongdoing and injustice. Um, so the ability to take jargon, to take complicated processes, to take stuff that is supposed to be opaque and make it understandable is key and maybe one of your most important tasks when you're doing investigative business journalism. That's a great point. Great point. Cool. Thank you. So a lot of people have kind of touched on you know necessary skills and um, and the the things you have to do to prepare yourself for an investigation like this. Um, as a lot of uh, young aspiring journalists here, um, I'd like to know. Um, how you, um, you know, a, a lot of the time, in my understanding, it's, it's, it's difficult to get on an investigative story that takes a significant amount of time to convince editors that, you know, it's worth undertaking that. What are some of the things and how, are, how can, uh, you know, a young journalist, uh, and, and I think probably this is especially relevant for Neil, um, show that you know you're ready for that uh, and that you can uh, effectively undertake that um, it's an interesting question for me because uh, I have a really non-traditional path into journalism and when I got into journalism uh, I started immediately with investigative journalism uh, as a data reporter um, but I think really early on I knew I wanted to make the switch to full-time investigative reporter, and I knew I needed to prove that I could do that, because I think it's really easy for editors and bosses to assume that a data reporter does data analysis and can't make the switch. Um, so I, I watched the reporters around me for what they did uh, and came up with some of my own techniques. And I think it's a matter of, I mean, if you are in a beat reporting role where you're reporting every day, or you're in a role that isn't investigative journalism, be willing to have your own notes on your ideas for the investigations you want to tackle and start building a body of evidence. Start building, um, all my previous editors really love memos, uh, which is just an easy way to say, write a two pager on your goods. What reporting do you have? What is your story? What is your pitch? Um, and so as you start to have ideas, as you start to poke holes in them, find the strengths and weaknesses, get the goods, um, build a memo that is a story pitch, uh, and when you have a really good story pitch, then take it to your editors. Because uh, editors may not want to make you an investigative reporter right out of college. They may not be willing to uh, give you that long-term role as a young reporter. But if you come to them with a good story, they want to publish good stories. <laughs> and they love that. Uh, so that is usually how I've always thought about it. Come up with a good story, get the pitch, vet it with some of my colleagues that I trust as mentors, um, and then give it to an editor who probably can't say no because one of their young, ambitious reporters just gave them a brilliant story. I, I spent about seven years as a beat business reporter before I was sort of full-time investigative. And 
um, to me, it's all about baby steps um, and showing that I have a, both an interest and an ability to execute something that didn't come from a press release. And so um, the way I got to do this full time was to do stories that might take a couple of days or a week, um, but were enterprising, were stories that weren't spoon fed to me by a source. Something it required some, you know, imagination to go find uh, and report out and write a story that wasn't in plain sight. And the more I did that, the more opportunity I got to do that same kind of work at higher and higher levels. Um, until, like an editor would say, gee, we got this really great political corruption story that's got a business angle, so who do we put on that? Well, we'll put a political reporter, and there's this guy in the business section, uh, he looks kind of investigative, let's put him on it, because there weren't that many people doing that kind of work. So just get that kind of a profile, and you'll get more opportunity. I think the data thing is really huge too. If you're if you are a young reporter, I, I said this in one of the classes that I spoke to earlier today. That, well, can I steal your line about the cheat 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 code? Uh, so uh, Will Kraft, who was the data reporter on our podcast, um, started with American Public Media as an intern, basically right out of college, right? Um, and uh, I, because I mean, a lot of people going to journalism are are a little bit allergic to uh, computer programming at that level. And so if you're willing to do that, and when you're in school, this is just a great opportunity to like take computer science classes or whatever, just get, become more numerate and more comfortable with data analysis. Um, that can like uh, jumpstart your career because there's, you know, you will, you will be very marketable um, at a young age if you're willing to do that kind of work and it kind of sets you apart. So um, I wish I'd done that earlier. I eventually came to get into it and I, you know, I think it's a really good idea. Let me add just one little thing to, I love hearing these guys. It's just everybody has a different, adds a different thing to this wonderful topic, but. I just want to add a general, a general thing rather than a specific thing. Uh, and whatever you do, unless it's written in such a way that people can understand it, uh, you fail. I mean, I've seen so many great stories fall flat because the writing wasn't right, it wasn't, the editing wasn't proper. So I think one of the easiest things and most, most important things a student can do is to read the good stuff. Go online, I mean, and this is something you can do today in a way that was much harder years ago. I mean, the Pulitzer uh, site has all, uh, all the works that have won. You can see how people have put it together, how they've constructed things. Investigative Reporters and Editors has exactly the same thing. You can go on and you can see how a story was, was done. I mean, that's part of being a craftsman, just to see what, how did they do this? How did, how did they get over this obstacle? How did they do that? And just the news release describing all of these uh, wonderful projects, and there are links to all of them as well, so you can see exactly how this work was done. So uh, William Faulkner had a great line about this. He said, when he was asked about writing, he said, my advice is read, read, read. Read the good stuff, read the bad stuff. The bad stuff is bad, throw it out, um, but you can never go wrong educating yourself that way. And just add a self-serving pitch, uh, there are, there's all the, their work is available on our website, businessjournalism.org, uh, as well as some fantastic interviews uh, with the winners uh, written by our team of graduate assistants. So check out the website as well. There are tons and tons of information there for you to, to read right. and read and read. <laughs> So this is kind of, oh, this is a very loud microphone. <laughs> so this is related to Caitlin's question. Um, is there a specific mindset that we should have when reporting on the private sector as opposed to the public sector? And are there unique challenges that y'all have faced covering the private sector that are different from covering the public sector? Good question. Wow. <laughs> I think the... I'll let everyone else answer, but I think the number one challenge uh, is this feeling like they're black holes. Mm -hmm. uh, there aren't, there can be huge reporting areas that just have no public records that 
uh, you need to get an insider to know what's going on. Uh, and I think that might be the toughest challenge I can think of. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's an art to that and there is a level of persistence in order to get insiders who can speak to black holes or the persistence to find the one public record that actually tells you a bit about what's going on. Um, but that can be really frustrating at times because you can have a sniff of a really good story and then just hit a wall and don't know where to go. Uh, and I think sometimes it takes persistence. Sometimes it takes putting the story down for a little bit and coming back to it later when you have fresh eyes, mm -hmm. uh, a fresh idea. Um, but that's the first thing I think of. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I feel like I, I came out of covering like City Hall and that kind of thing. So I was more used to dealing with government officials. And I, yeah, I think they are more, I mean, the whole thing is geared towards communicating with the public, which maybe depending on what industry you're focusing on is more or less public facing. So I think that's a challenge. Um, but I think the, the, when I think about like the investigation, whatever it is, whatever you're focused on, it's always like just a kind of a series of lists. Does that sound kind of basic? But that is what it is. Like you have, and that's where spreadsheets, we always talk about spreadsheets, you know, like it's like you build a spreadsheet of names of people that you want to try to talk to, right? You build lists of locations where you might want to try to get property records or figure out who, or get police calls to those. You make lists of uh, dates and things that happened on those dates. That's a timeline, you know, anyway. And um, so I just like, this maybe isn't quite the question you were asking, but I think it is just kind of like any project, like how do you eat an elephant, like one bite at a time, you know? <laughs> so like, and as long as I've still got something on this list, something I can try, you know, like, um, and, and, and list of questions, like, you know, what, what, do we, what do we know? What do we want to find out? kind of thing. So I think that that applies generally. Like you're trying to understand something, right? And so whether it's, you know, the mayor's budget or, you know, what this corporation has been up to, I feel like a lot of the same principles apply. Way too much business journalism is about the public companies because they're easy, mm -hmm. because they're reporting and so there's stuff out there and you can fill your week with doing nothing mm -hmm. but writing about public filings. Mm -hmm. And so I would preach the gospel of more private company coverage because they are operating in the shadows and they're generally lightly regulated and there is no mandatory disclosure requirements. And so it's a wonderful universe to play in because there's all kinds of great stories and because of the lack of oversight, the lack of disclosure, they're trying to get away with more shit. And so almost all of my investigations have focused on private companies uh, because that's where the good stuff usually is, and uh, at least in my experience. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so the strategy on cracking that company or that industry has been different every time. And sometimes it is, it's data and documents. Sometimes it's just people. Like when we went after Garrison Keillor over the sexual harassment stuff, uh, there were no documents. Um, it was all like, well, it was the Woodward and Bernstein approach. We got to identify every single person that worked on Garrison Keillor's show and talk to them and find out what the hell was going on here. And did 40 interviews before we figured it out. Um, and we just had to take that organization and work every seam. And it was pure human reporting. So it, there is no sort of playbook that works the same for every private company. Mm -hmm. You just got to figure it out as you go along. So I have a follow-up question um, that's related. So how do you know when you're going down the wrong rabbit hole, the wrong black hole, or the treacherous path of over-reporting when you should be publishing or writing multiple stories? Hit diminishing returns. You know, you know, it's like, I mean, you should always keep, I keep reporting up until <laughs> publication, it seems like, um, because there's always stuff. That you, that you could keep on mm -hmm. picking at and trying to get a little bit more detail there or something like that. But I feel like when you feel like you've, you've put, get, put in another week and you've gotten this little increment better, and then you write what you know. Okay, well, what do we know now? Well, that's pretty good, you know? 
<laughs> like, I think, I, think we might, I think we might have a story here, you know, and we can start writing. And, and as you're writing and revising, you, then you do do more reporting. Your editor says, well, what about this? This is a hole here, you know. And so it's, uh, there, it's not, never, I feel like, a completely clean break where, like, when we were writing the podcast, we were still reporting the podcast. And then we wrote it, and then we got some very critical interviews that required us to rewrite everything we'd already written. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I don't know. It never it never stops until until you hit publish. This is an excellent point because I think a question I have been asked repeatedly over the years. I mean, way back. How do you know? When do you know when you're done? <laughs> and it took me years to realize I was never done. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's good news or bad news, but I mean, there's always more things. I mean, we all know that. I mean, no matter how deep you look, no matter how much you've done, I mean, there's always more things. So just at a certain point, you have to start writing and see how it holds together. If there's a huge hole, you got to fill it. Um, and you do the best you can. I also want to address the first part of that question, which was how do you know if you're going down a rabbit hole and you uh -huh, don't yeah. actually have a story, mm -hmm. uh, which is part of the process. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you can't do investigative journalism properly if you don't let yourself decide this isn't a story. Because if you are just reporting, 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 telling yourself this is a story, hitting a thousand holes, mm -hmm. it doesn't work when you put it in writing, but you're going to force it into publication, you're going to get in trouble. Uh, and you never want to be there. So you want to be able to say two months down the line, three months down the line, this isn't it. Uh, and so, um, the way I do that, uh, everyone does it differently, but uh, I am generally, when I'm doing long-term investigative reporting, so six months to a year, um, I'm still writing memos, documents every month, mm -hmm. every two weeks sometimes, to have a document that says, what do I have? What are the holes that are remaining? Mm -hmm. um, and have that as like a living document that grows and builds. And if the holes are growing, if uh, the questions are growing, if your main thesis isn't holding up and there isn't an alternative, you start to realize this isn't the story. Um, and that also allows you, when you write it up, you can also share it with your editor. You can share it with colleagues you trust and get their input too. Because it's also really easy when you're in investigative reporting to have tunnel vision. Um, we have to work so hard, focus so hard on a certain topic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's hard for us to give up on a story. Mm -hmm. um, so you also want a group of people that you trust, it, whether it's your editor, whether it's just people in the industry that you know can tell you, I don't think you have it. Uh, you want that because you never want to be publishing a story that, that isn't there. And just one quick addition. Um, if find it, it, when you're starting out, try to figure out if there's a minimum story. You know, you know what the maximum that you're going for is, but can you tell your editors, look, even if I don't get the holy shit, you know, Pulitzer you know, finalist story, mm -hmm. there's gonna be something here. This, is, this exercise is gonna yield a Sunday Enterprise story. And here's probably what that looks like. Um, that's gonna get you a green light a lot faster than going on a totally open-ended fishing expedition where there's no guaranteed payoff. Uh, and I found that to be very successful in getting me on projects that looked kind of interesting in the beginning and got a lot more interesting the more we learned about them. Yeah, we, we call it the least possible story. And it's kind of like what you already, that's sort of like what you already know almost, right? When you go in, it's not so much the question based, that it's the insurance policy, like baseline, this is mildly interesting. <laughs> right? right, there's something there, this hasn't really been written about and I've found this much. And that's what kind of gets you over the, over the hurdle to then go after the big unknown, right? Like, the, the, would you say like the least story is kind of like the thing that you more or less have when you're pitching kind of thing? Right, because you've done enough preliminary reporting yeah. to, to tell your editors, this looks like fertile ground. Mm -hmm. um, and if I go down this road, there's a chance we can get this amazing holy shit story. But if we don't, at the, at the very minimum, I'm going to have the Sunday story for you, and this is what that's going to look like based on my preliminary report. And then they're like, well, sure, no lose, no lose proposition. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. And that, 
then you get to do a lot more of that. This minimum maximum story is actually what I put in those memos. Mm -hmm. uh, and every month, that minimum starts really low and that maximum is all lofty. And usually over time, you are finding some sort of middle ground. And hopefully that middle ground is much closer to the maximum story. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know a story isn't working when somehow you've gotten below the original minimum you <laughs> sought out for. <laughs> for some reason, you poked a hole in what you thought was fertile ground and realized this, this isn't there. So great advice. Well, I think we got you know, the maximum holy shit advice uh, here uh, tonight from our panelists. I just want to say thank you so much for your generosity and, and sharing your, your experience, your knowledge, uh, and for making the trip to Phoenix despite the fact that it's almost certainly rainier and colder here than where you came from. Uh, just bad, bad timing. And thank you, everyone uh, in attendance, for your wonderful questions. Uh, I know a lot of us in this room didn't get much sleep last night. There were a few things going on. Um, but thank you for joining us here today. I, I hope it was helpful, and uh, I'm delighted you could make it. And thank you again to our, our wonderful panelists and our, our uh, award winners who made the journey. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>